Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is for the months of July, August, and September of 2015, and it's entitled Biblical Missionaries. Do you know any biblical missionaries? Well, we've talked about Abraham. We've talked about the little Jewish slave girl that was a servant to our slave to Naaman. And now we're going to talk about Jonah. So this lesson is entitled The Jonah Saga. This is lesson number four in this series for July 25 of 2015. We hope you've got your Bible handy because we're going to do some references in the Bible. Look at the book of Jonah for sure. But uh, right now we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, it's a privilege to read your word, even reading about rebellious characters like Jonah. What can we learn from him? And how did he end up being so successful in his evangelistic campaign? We ask you that you will guide us as we think about his story. As in Jesus' name, amen. Well, from the days of Abraham to the present time, God has struggled to get his faithful people to witness to foreigners, if I can use quotation marks, to get people to reach out to others around them. The story of Jonah is a very interesting account of an occasion when God specifically ordered one of his prophets to reach out to a heathen, savage, warlike group of people in the city of Nineveh and give them the gospel message. How would you like to be chosen to do Jonah's job? Buddy, comment? These were, if I recall the, my history, these were the Assyrians, were people that were notorious for beating and skinning their alive, their uh, captives. They did this sometimes. And they were just very brutal. Yeah. Well, what do we know about Jonah? Jonah was a recognized prophet of God, and how do we know that? Look at 2 Kings 14, 25. And we really ought to stop, probably start with 23, just so we get a little background. In the 15th year of the reign of Amaziah, son of Joash, as king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, became king of Israel, and he ruled in Samaria for 41 years. He sinned against the Lord following the wicked example of his predecessor king Jeroboam son of Nebat who led Israel into sin. So what kind of a king is this and what's going on in the nation? Wicked. Wicked. He, re he, um, he reconquered all the territory that had belonged to Israel so he was a successful military leader from Hamath Pass in, in the north to the Dead Sea in the south. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, had promised to his servant, the prophet Jonah, son of Amittai, from gath Hefer. So what does that tell us? He's a recognized prophet, right? And he's predicted what's going to happen to the nation, and it happens. Mm -hmm. It's good for your reputation, right? So one of his prophecies came true, huh? At least one of them. Well, and maybe even, he may even have been employed by the king. Prophets sometimes were employed by the kings. This was around about 750 B.C. Jeroboam II was a very wicked king, following the example of Jeroboam I, who intentionally turned the people of the northern kingdom of Israel away from the worship of Yahweh. And why did he take them away from the worship of Yahweh? He married into the opposition. Okay, what he was worried about is that people would go down to the south, see the beautiful temple that Solomon had built in Jerusalem, and be inclined to give allegiance to the king down there instead of allegiance to him. So he built that altar at Bethel and another one at Dan, the southern tip of his kingdom and the northern tip of his kingdom. He said, come worship these places here. This is fine. You don't need to go down to Jerusalem. And what did God think about that? Remember the story of 2 Kings 13. 
or was it First Kings actually? No, it's Second Kings. Even the disciples, no, it's First Kings. Yeah, it was First Kings. Even the disciples, this was of course the first year of Boom. Even the disciples of Jesus had a very difficult time accepting the idea that they were supposed to reach out to Samaritans and Gentiles. Okay, what stories can you think of that would support that idea? What about the story of Peter and Cornelius in Acts 10 and 11? The woman at the well. Yeah, the Samaritan woman. Incredible. Acts 11, 18, after Peter had gone to great lengths to relate the story of Cornelius, they said when they heard this, they stopped their criticism and praised God, saying, then God has given to the Gentiles also the opportunity to repent and live. That was an eye-opening occasion. <laughs> yeah. And, and how did they come to that conclusion? God, Peter knew what was going to happen. He took seven witnesses with him. And God's Spirit was poured out upon Cornelius and his family. And Peter says, just like he was poured out on us at the Pentecost. day of Pentecost. So he comes back with all this evidence and the people, the brethren say, hmm, hmm, hmm. You mean God might be willing to bless Gentiles too? It was just about like that. Crazy. I don't know if they they actually liked it. it was something it was something that they had. Oh, you mean we got to get used to this idea? Yeah. It might take me a while, but maybe I can do it. <laughs> okay, let's work our way through the Jonah story. Try to imagine Jonah's initial reaction when God called him to go and preach a message of salvation to the people of Nineveh, one of the capitals of Assyria. What do we know about Assyria now? We've already talked a little bit about that. Assyria had repeatedly invaded Israel, conquered Israel, forced them to pay tribute, murdered many Israelites, generally made their lives miserable. And what does God say to Jonah now? Go convert them. Yeah. Go and preach the gospel to them. Come around. And you would say what? Jonah probably thought, they don't need this 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 help. They they need to be kicked around. They need to get kicked back. What are you doing? <laughs> There's some interesting parallels between the story of Jonah and the story of Jesus. One of the interesting things to start out with is Gath Hever that he came from is like two or three miles from Nazareth. So both of them would have been called Galilean prophets. Okay. Of course, they were separated by, what, 250 years or 750 years, whatever it is? 750. 750, yeah. Okay, we'll need to read a few verses from Jonah. Turn to Jonah. I'm going to read a few verses. One day the Lord spoke to Jonah, son of Amittai. So that's the same one that we already mentioned, right? He said, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and speak out against it. I am aware how wicked his people are, does God know how wicked they are? Of course. Yeah, God knows. Jonah, however, set out in the opposite direction in order to get away from the Lord. He went to Joppa where he found a ship about to go to Spain. He paid his fare and went aboard the crew, went aboard with the crew to sail to Spain where he would be away from the Lord, Yahweh. Did it work? It makes you wonder a bit about Jonah's faith or general outlook here and there. Why was he a prophet? But if you were told to go, uh, let's say, uh, told to go to North Korea and mm -hmm. speak out against North Korea right now, you know, how willing would you be to do that? It would give you a pause. <laughs> oh, uh, you didn't say that, did you? Well. <laughs> if you've been listening to the news over the last few years, you'll... <laughs> well, okay. So what happens? No, Jonah goes, gets on the boat, goes down in the bottom and goes to sleep. A huge storm comes up. Well, we don't know exactly whether it was immediately or somewhere 
after they'd been out on the ocean for a couple, I mean, out on the Mediterranean for a couple of days. We don't know exactly when it happened. But anyway, Jonah's sleeping in the bottom of the boat, right? And a big storm comes up. And what happens? They're all praying to their heathen deities, right? To the gods of this and that and the other. And the captain of the boat comes down into the bottom of the boat and finds Jonah sleeping. So what does he say to him? Probably get up and help out. But uh, I think Jonah pretty early co cottoned on to what was going on and why. Mm -hmm. Get up and pray to your God for help. Get up and pray to your God for help. We're all going to die, right? So they knew he was a prophet. No. no Why yeah. would they say, pray to your God? They were all praying to their gods. Everybody, oh, they, so yeah, they, was, everybody was. was Join in. So maybe your asleep. gods, I see. maybe your God will do it. So they said, what are you doing here? Sleeping in the bottom of the world, about to die. What country do you come from? What is your nationality? And Jonah says, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made land and sea. I wonder what the parallel is between that and Jesus and the disciples going across the Sea of Galilee when the storm, Jesus is sleeping. He had a confidence. So yeah. they, 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 to know what kind of a prophet Jonah was, he did, have, he did know. Well, think about this. The stories, this is another the parallel between these two stories. Jonah says, in order to stop the, the, the storm, you've got to throw me over. They threw him over, and what happened? Immediately the storm, the, the sea is calm. In the case of Jesus, the disciples woke Jesus up. We're about to drown. You know, we fishermen need some help from the carpenter. I always have to chuckle about that. And Jesus said, well, what's wrong with your faith? He stood up and said, be still. Yeah. The same one that could separate the waters in creation week. Mm -hmm. and uh, speak to the storm. So Jonah actually said, and I quote, throw me into the sea and it will calm down. I know it is my fault that you're caught in this violent storm. How did he know that? I think he put two and two together. <laughs> okay, let's just review the major points of the story. From deep inside, now, Jonah gets sm swallowed by a fish, a whale, or whatever. We don't know whatever. From deep inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God. In my distress, O Lord, I called to you and you answered me. From deep in the world of the dead, I cried for help and you, helped, you heard me. You threw me down into the depths to the very bottom of the sea where the waters were all around me and all your mighty waves rolled over me. I thought I had been banished from your presence and would never see your holy temple again. The water came over me and choked me. The sea covered me completely, and seaweed was wrapped around my head. I went down to the very roots of the mountains and into the land whose gates locked shut forever. What land is that? Death. Death. But you, O Lord, my God, brought me back from the depths alive. When I felt my life slipping away, then, O Lord, I prayed to you, and in your holy temple you heard me. Those who worship worthless idols have abandoned their loyalty to you, but I will sing praises to you. I will offer you a sacrifice and do what I have promised. Savior, I mean, salvation comes from the Lord. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spew Jonah up on the beaches, and it did. Bang. So, what happens next? Once again, the Lord spoke to Jonah. <laughs> Once again, the Lord spoke to Jonah. He said, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to the people the message I gave you, I have given you. So Jonah obeyed the Lord and went to Nineveh, and a city so large that it took three days to walk through it. Jonah started through the city, and after walking a whole day, he proclaimed, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. How much of the rest of, the sermon, of his sermon do we have? None. None. What do you think of his gospel? In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Is that an appealing gospel? <laughs> the people of Nineveh believed God's message, so they decided that everyone should fast, and all the people from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth to show how they had repented. Now, why would they believe? Here, a, an enemy 
and someone from an enemy land comes and tells them you're going to be destroyed. Why would you believe that? Yeah. Unless they knew something about the story of what had happened to Jonah in the preceding days. Unless there were some witnesses that you don't came think and Jonah, said... You don't think Jonah was just a powerful preacher? No. <laughs> Maybe all he had was seaweed around him. He must have said more than what we have <laughs> at our fingertips. You think being those a couple, two or three days in the belly of the well or belly of the fish affected his skin in any way? Probably. Yes, I think that's been documented elsewhere, not in the Bible. And he surely must have spoken with some real conviction, though, and he wasn't waffling about it. I mean, after no. been through, you go through that kind of experience. He, re he got refocused. <laughs> <It> sure did. <laughs> Well, we believe that Jonah was a prophet. I mean, it seems to suggest that Jonah was a prophet of the true God. Um, he lived in the midst of a rebellious nation. He chose to rebel against God. Can you blame him? We're not even sure who wrote his, bo his book, but we're, we're sure about one thing. Whoever wrote it, whether it was Jonah himself, which was likely, but, or we, but we don't know for sure. Whoever wrote it didn't, didn't, sort of, you know, cover over Jonah's sins, did he? No. Well, do you, do you find it encouraging to, to see that God uses flawed human beings? Was this the best he had to work with in this time period? There's a good question. Probably. I mean, would God have chosen Jonah if there was someone who could have done a better job? If God didn't use flawed human beings, who would he use? Exactly. I mean, think Angels. about it. Even, even Moses and Isaiah thought they couldn't speak. Amos said, I'm, I'm just a farmer. Gideon was a frightened idol worshiper. And Moses was a murderer. Yeah. Well, so was David and Solomon and so forth and Samson. What a, think about how God used them. Well, look at Isaiah 56, verse 7. Isaiah 56, verse 7. I will bring you to Zion, my sacred hill, give you joy in my house of prayer, and accept the sacrifices you offer to me to my, on my altar. My temple will be called a house of prayer for the people of all nations. But now we have a, diff we have a changed scene. Repeatedly in the Old Testament, God has called for the nations to come and worship at the temple in Jerusalem, right? Well, what happens in this story? God sends Jonah over to Nineveh, a long ways away. Does he tell them that they all have to go to Israel? Go to, go to Jerusalem? Well, the story of Jonah is in the big fish is quite widely known. Um, you've probably heard funny stories about this. One of the best ones I like is a story about a little girl who went to Sunday school and she got, uh, the teacher apparently had made up some little things that showed the big fish on the, you know, little paper things that showed the big fish on the front. It was a kind of included the story of Jonah inside. So she's standing outside after Sunday school waiting for, for her parents to come pick her up probably in the days when that was safer to do. And along comes a guy and he says, little girl, wh what's that book you have there? Well, this thing she had. Well, it's the story of Jonah. He says, well, what, what happened to Jonah? Well, he swallowed by a big fish. Do you believe that? Hmm? Yeah, I believe that. Little girl says, oh, I believe it. He says, <clears throat> what do you think Jonah was thinking while he was down in the belly of that fish? She thought for a moment. She says, I don't know. He says, well, he says, how are you going to fight? She says, well, she says, well, maybe when we get to heaven, well, I'll just ask Jonah. And so the man says to the little girl, well, what if, what if Jonah doesn't go to heaven? And the little girl says, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there's lots of funny stories about there's another story about a, uh, this was a Sabbath school teacher that was teaching a group of young P2 
people and said, what did you learn from the story of Jonah? You can't keep a good man down. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, enough of the funny stories. <laughs> Why do you choose to believe the story of Jonah? Do you think it's a factual story, or is this is some kind of a made-up story? Well, it's easier to believe than even crossing the Red Sea. So why would you, yeah, why would you balk at this one? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not the most outlandish thing that happened in the Old Testament. That's a good enough reason to believe it. <laughs> Any other suggestions? Well, there's probably a lot of symbolism there that Isn't it comes through. Recorded that they straightened out, but then generations later they went bad again. Somewhere mm -hmm. I think I came across. Yeah, that. It wasn't that long later that they yeah. destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel? Yeah, attacked Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. In fact, within a, within 50 years or so of then, wasn't it? About no. Uh, this would have been well, a hundred, a little over a hundred years. So who is worse? Well, probably not from the first time they attacked Israel, yeah. and the first time was probably was sooner. But who is worse, Israel or Nineveh, when they had that battle? Hard to tell. Yeah. Yeah. Was it Nineveh in this time period as bad, like for an American to go to North Korea, that hostile? Would it have been for him? Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Particularly if he made any kind of statements against the government. Maybe not if he just traveled there. And if there were any Israelites in, in Nineveh in those days, they would be slaves. They wouldn't be, you know, they wouldn't be outstanding citizens. So either. it was hostile for mm -hmm. him to go. Okay. Well, okay. Um, Let's look at some parallels here. Most of the pagan nations in Jonah's day believed that the sea was inhabited by an evil god called Mot. And Jonah recognized that, Jonah by contrast recognized that Yahweh was the true god of both land and sea. Why do you think, why do you think the, the evil, the nations believed that there was an evil god in the, in the ocean by the name of Mot? Any idea? Well, they had gods for pretty much everything, didn't they? Yeah, but why would they? Why would they pick an evil god to be representative of the ocean? So many people went to sea and didn't come back. Heck, yeah. yeah, that's part of it. And the other, well, and that's basically a large part of it. And it, it never seemed to be peaceful. I mean, there's big waves crashing on the sound. I mean, this god is seems to be angry all the time. Well. Let's look at some parallels now. Uh, are there any parallels between uh, the story of Jonah and our day? Oh, yeah. What kind of parallels? Well, we're supposed to be spreading the world as we understand it worldwide. There's some verses I'm sure you memorized at some point in your career, educational career, like the ones found in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you and I will be with, you, be with you always to the end of the age. Could that apply to any of us? Boy, we're all committal <laughs> right here, aren't we? Yeah. Well, the if if you include Revelation fourteen six and seven, it goes on in Revelation thirteen that basically says the same thing. We're supposed to read out to every nation, tribe, language, people. I mean, these are people what we might today call people groups, and we're supposed to reach every one of them. Are we doing it? And if we live comfortably in Loma Linda, is that a good place to spread the gospel? The rest of the world. Now, some of us might say, "Well, we're we're doing it through television right now. We're going all over the world." Radio, and radio, 
And internet. And internet. Yeah. And to the sea next door. Well, do you know what the early Adventists thought about these passages? About Matthew 28, 19, and 20? They looked, at, they looked at how small a group they were, and they said, well, there's no way we could ever reach out to the whole world. So God, if this verse is supposed to apply to us, it must mean that we need to reach out to all the people from all the different countries in the world who come to America. That's what they thought their goal was. And maybe those people will talk to their friends back home. Well, do you think it is possible that God still expects us to reach out and carry the gospel to communist nations? Think about it right now. If you received, went home tonight and you received a message that you knew was from God, and he says, I want you to go to Siberia or China or even Cuba. Or how about some really friendly places like Saudi Arabia, or Syria, or Yemen, or even Somalia? It would seem unwise. <laughs> it would seem very well put. Um, don't we believe there's only one God? I mean, just in our country here, how are we supposed to relate to the people who don't believe that God even exists? Who think that this whole, everything that's happened here is a result of a big bang and and it's some kind of billions of years of evolutionary history. And they laugh at everything in the Bible. How are we supposed to relate to those people? I know I'm asking some tough questions. <laughs> I was just going to say, keep, keep trying. Keep trying, yeah. Because when you look at the, for example, statistics of Advent World Radio right now, we are actually getting a lot of internet connections from China. I mean, tremendous amount. Mm -hmm. Not just China, from other places. All, all over. There's, I think last year, 2013 or 2014, they've got something like, uh, it was either eight and three quarter or seven and three quarter billion downloads from computers. Wow. I'm not billion, not million, billion. Yeah. Which is unheard of, but we're doing it and yeah. we're getting results. Well, suppose you're with a group of non-Christian friends and someone happens to mention the Bible, and they say, well, what do you think about that story of Jonah? Would you like to pretend that you don't know anything about Jonah at that point? I think it can be done. You've, you've got to be careful how you go about it. There's, even unbelievers, there's, there's usually a chink in their armor somewhere, mm -hmm. just for general conversation. You don't have to put yourself behind the eight ball, as they say, you, th there's ways around it. Okay, well, now let me, let me, ma let me make this, the, the, the challenge a little tougher. Look at Matthew 12, starting with verse 39. Matthew 12, starting with verse 39. How evil and godless are the people of this day. This is Jesus talking. Jesus exclaimed, you ask me for a miracle? No, the only miracle you will be given is the miracle of the prophet Jonah. Who's talking? Jesus, what he's going to say? He's talking about the prophet Jonah. In the same way that Jonah spent three days and nights in the big fish, so will the Son of Man spend three days and nights in the depths of the earth. Did Jesus believe the story of Jonah? It seems so. Sounds like it, doesn't it? Yeah. And yet... He also talked about the story of the rich man and Lazarus, mm -hmm. who we say, well, that was, we, he just said that because that was a story that they knew. So is, is this a case of Jesus quotes this story because he knows that they're familiar with it, whether it's true or not? I think it's because it was true, but we have to be careful how we use the statement yeah. that Jesus talked mm -hmm. about that story. Well, is it possible for a person to be swallowed by a fish or by a whale and survive? Yes. Well, if you go to our website, and if you happen to get our hand out to all the websites there, but I can just tell you, go to theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Go under, under um, Teacher's Guides. Go to the Old Testament. Go to Minor Prophets. Look up Jonah. There are some documented stories, even in recent history, where people have been swallowed by 
whales, basically, in this case, that we know about, and the whales have vomited them up and they have survived. Of course, the real point of this story is that that was a miraculous occurrence, right? So we, we just have to assume that God protected and took care of Jonah during that day. There is evidence, however, that this expression, three days and nine, three nights, was the ancient figure of speech expressing the time needed for the imaginary journey to Sheol, or to the grave. The Hebrew name for the realm of the dead. Considering what happened to him, Jonah indeed should have been as good as dead. Now, where else, what other evidence do we have that they thought a person would, would reach the, 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 the home of the dead in three days? Can you think of other evidence we have from the New Testament, for example? Lazarus is dead for three days. Well, he was dead for four days because they wanted to make sure he was really dead, right? And then Jesus resurrected him. So that was a common belief. Okay, whether it was, I mean, we, we know it's not true, but they thought it was true. Well, what should we learn from the psalm that Jonah prayed while he was in the belly of the fish. We read part of it already. Jonah, in Jonah chapter 2. It's interesting that it follows a very definite plan, pattern. One, an introduction. Two, a description of the distress that you're in. Three, a cry to God for help. Four, a report of God's action. What did God do? In the case of Jonah, what did he do? He spit him out on the dry land, right? And five, a promise to keep any vow made and to testify to God's saving action. Have you ever made such a vow when you're under a stressful situation? I won't ask you to give a personal testimony. So how do you think Job felt, Job, how do you think Jonah felt the next time God said, Guess what, Jonah? <laughs> you still haven't gotten to Nineveh. I think he figured this time I better go. <laughs> I think I, <laughs> this time I better go, right. God is very persistent, isn't he? And he seems to expect us to do what he wants us to do. And he clearly wants us to witness for him. So God's general directions and messages are often given in the general format of a threat and then a promise. Sometimes we call that judgment and gospel. How does that work? If you don't do this, da-da-da. But if you do do this, da-da-da, right? Well, the sermon we have, the, the, the recorded portion of Jonah's sermon that we have is seven words. What are those words? In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Jonah 3, 4. Why do you suppose that's the part of the story that gets recorded? Gets preserved? Say there's seven words. Set. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Seven words, that's interesting. And then 40 days is... Of course, that's seven words in English. Yeah. Well, it could have been a direct translation, word for word. Possibly, but probably isn't. But anyway. I bet you it is. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> you made me forget what I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> you said 40, uh, 40 days. Well, there's 40 days is a, is a number that's repeated in the Bible. Yeah. Lots, too. So well, Surely Jonah must have said more than just that. I would say so. Do so. you think he stopped to answer any questions? I really wonder if being in that, that experience did something to him that made people know somehow he must have provided some kind of evidence about his experience. Well, we just don't know. You know. We jokingly talk about seaweed wrapped around his neck. Maybe but, uh, somebody saw him getting delivered to the beach. Who knows? That's possible. Maybe he had acid burns on his skin. Yeah, yeah. Possible. <laughs> it's possible. 
Well, you know the passage found in Revelation 14, 6 to 12. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. We've already talked a little bit about this. He said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise His greatness, for the time has come for Him to judge. Worship Him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed the first one, saying, She has fallen, great Babylon has fallen. She made all peoples drink her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, Whoever worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on their forehead or on their hand will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured out, poured at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them will go up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast in its image, for anyone who has the mark of its name. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. So, have we been given a message to take to the world? Definitely. When I was young, we used to say, when a person joined the Adventist church, we used to say, he's accepted the third angel's message. We don't hear that as much anymore, but that used to be the message. Well, is our, is our message in some ways similar to Jonah's message? Repent, or in 40 days you'll, Nineveh will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And this message is repent, or in who knows how many years or days, the earth will be destroyed. Well, what was the response to Jonah's message? They repented. The whole city apparently repented, at least enough so that it was reported as being the whole city. Do you know any other evangelist that was that, that successful? No. No. I'm so being, are you putting this all on him, all on Jonah? I'm just look, recording the story. We're, we're talking about the story. I know, but you got, you're trying to get us to put it all together, too. Well, I mean, Jonah was the Jonah was the medium, in this case. The medium. Okay, so. And and something very interesting. Jonah is the only person in the scriptures who accuses God of being gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, and who relents from sending calamity. One would think most people would view these aspects of God with thankfulness. Right. Well, they do nowadays because Jesus came. But back then, um, wasn't the most powerful God the God? Mm -hmm. The one that won all the wars? Weren't they the most powerful God? That's what they thought. Well, it might be what Jonah thought. Wasn't Jonah more concerned about his own reputation rather than God's well, reputation? When Jonah learned of God's purpose to spare the city, that notwithstanding his wickedness had, and I'm reading now from Prophets and Kings, notwithstanding its wickedness had been led to repent in sackcloth and ashes, mm -hmm. he should have been the first to rejoice because of God's amazing grace. But instead, he allowed his mind to dwell upon the possibility of his being regarded as a false prophet. He thought, that his reputation was more important than the lives of, we know, at least 120,000 people. It may have been 120,000 children. He was afraid that God really what, probably wouldn't follow through and, and destroy the mm -hmm. city. Mm -hmm. And then he would look like a... Well, jealous mm -hmm. of his reputation, Ellen White says, he lost sight of the infinitely greater value of the souls of that, in that wretched city. The compassion shown by God toward the repentant Ninevites displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. Now, why would Jonah be regarded as a false prophet? Is that based on biblical evidence? If well, think about it. Well, think, th think about it now. Jonah, after trying to escape by sea, comes back home. He received the message again, go to Nineveh. And God, I'm sure did, God didn't just say go to Nineveh. He must have given him some instructions. What to say. So he turns to all his friends and he says, guess what? I've got the biggest prophetic commission of my life. I'm going to Nineveh 
and I'm going to single-handedly destroy that city. Right? You, you, you look, you're, you're making that as a scenario. Mm -hmm. That would explain it. And? Isn't that what you think he would have said? Well, maybe he thought they wouldn't be, they wouldn't repent. Well, and he was he was pretty sure of that. And then when they did, he was disappointed. And now he comes back home and they said, you did it. Uh, well, mm, they repented. So God didn't destroy them. They what? I mean, think about it. Yeah. They what? So it's Deuteronomy 18, 21 and 22 that says yes. a false prophet it's a false prophet if your prophecy doesn't come true. Mm -hmm. So you think that maybe he said that God is going to destroy Nineveh mm -hmm. instead of telling them the truth, uh, telling well, them what, what God he, that's the way he understood really the message, told him. Wasn't it? It's what God said to him. Well, he said to go to Nineveh. Well, you don't think he told him what to, what was going to happen, what he was going to do, what he was supposed to do? So you're saying that God told told um, him that he was going to destroy the city of Nineveh. In 40 days. There in was 40 probably days. an if in there somewhere, but Jonah might have forgotten to say that part. <laughs> but then why even go there? I mean, why didn't he do it like Sodom and Gomorrah? I mean, yeah. the stuff just started falling. Well, a lot had been there for a while. Oh, that's a good point. You're right there. Abraham had been nearby for quite a while. Well, here's an interesting other point. Look at Romans 1, verses 16 and 17. Romans 1, 16 and 17. This is Paul, of course, now speaking. I have complete... Now, this is my Good News Bible. It's a little different. The King James will say, I'm not ashamed. Paul says, I have complete confidence in the gospel. It is God's power to save all who believe, first the Jews and also the Gentiles. For the gospel reveals how God puts people right with himself. It is through faith from beginning to end. As the scripture says, the person who is put right with God through faith shall live. How does that sound compared to Jonah's message? Well, look at Jonah's message, comments about Jonah in, in chapter 4, the first three verses. Jonah was very unhappy about this and became angry because the Ninevites had repented. So he prayed, Lord, didn't I say before I left home that this is just what you would do? That's why I did my best to run away to Spain. I knew that you are a loving and merciful God, always patient, always kind, always ready to change your mind and not punish. Now, the Lord, let me, now Lord, let me die. I'm better off dead than alive. The Lord answered, What right have you to be angry? Jonah went out east of the city and sat down. He made a shelter for himself and sat in its shade, waiting to see what would happen to Nineveh. And you know what happened. It didn't get destroyed. It didn't get destroyed. So you think that God told Jonah that he's going to destroy the city in 40 days, but yet Jonah, Nona, uh, Jonah comes back and says that you're a loving God, you're, you forgive and all this stuff. So I don't quite understand well, what's the dynamics here. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what you're. I'm not sure if I'm getting to the point of your question. I, I think I don't think it got, God would have expected to Jonah go to to go to Nineveh without giving fairly clear instructions. And clearly, the message we have recorded, and we argued, we discussed about what else he might have said. But the message we have recorded was, Nineveh would be destroyed in 40 days. I think God had to say that to Jonah. I don't think Jonah would have dared to speak, preach that kind of a message unless he'd been told that. Okay? So, what would Jonah have said to his friends when he finally headed for Nineveh? Okay, I kind of, yeah, I see what you mean. If, if God made up his mind that I'm going to destroy Nineveh in 40 days, well, the question always comes up, what if they repent? Mm -hmm. And 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 unfortunately, and, we don't have that information given to us. And Jonah probably thought, 
what if they did repent? Oh, they probably will because you're this, that, and the other thing. Well, and I if mean, they do, that means that means they're not going to be destroyed, and I'm going to look bad. Jonah probably thought those wicked Assyrians. You think they're going to listen to me? Not a chance in the world. Yeah, it could be. But Ellen White says all of God's threatenings and promises are conditional. Mm -hmm. So what was Jonah's problem? He's too worried about himself. Too worried about himself. Well, Ellen White has some very interesting words to say about this. The terrible earthquake that was, has visited San Francisco, now, there was a San Francisco earthquake of April 18 and 19 of 1906, left 503 people dead and resulted in an estimated $350 million in property damage. Now, $350 million in 1906 was a lot of money. It will be followed by other manifestations of the power of God, and boy, you seem, I think we're seeing it today, wow. His law has been transgressed. Cities have become polluted with sin. Study the history of Nineveh. God sent a special message to, by Jonah to that wicked city. Many such messages as his would be given in our age if the wicked cities would repent as did Nineveh. How about that? I think she'd be staggered if she saw the size of New York and London and some of those cities. Mexico City now is, what, over 30 million? So does this mean that if they aren't going to repent, then we're not going to give the message? Kind of sounds like that. This almost sounds like, you know, don't bother to preach to the cities because they're not going to repent, doesn't it? Well, you could read it that way. I'm not sure that's the way it's meant based on the parable of throwing the, of Jesus in the seed, throwing it even on the mm -hmm. rocky ground. Okay, well, does that mean we're relieved of our responsibilities to carry the gospel to the cities because they will not repent? No. What if we present the message poorly? <laughs> what about that? Maybe God won't bless us. Won't even, and that's one of the questions we need to ask about this whole business. If, you don't, if you're not carrying the right message about God, will, will, will God dare to bless you to go and preach? Maybe someone else will bless you. Yeah. Well, if you're not, if you're not preaching the right message, you must be doing it for another motive. There's a thought. Maybe you just don't have the right information. Maybe it's a good motive, but okay, we live this misinformation. Do you think that would get you in trouble? We live. We live fairly close to uh, Los Angeles. Yeah, really. What if tonight in your bed you get a vision from God, God says, I have assigned you to carry the gospel to Los Angeles? If he did? No, well, he hasn't. I have to tell you. <laughs> you think you're lucky, huh? <laughs> tonight hasn't happened yet. <laughs> well, I'll tell you tomorrow if I get it. Okay. Vision. Well, would you say, God, you must not know what you're talking about? Would you say that's impossible? What would you say? You would need a set plan because it would seem overwhelming. Well, I mean, so the real question is this. If God, if we're really convinced that God has called us to do something, I mean, that's one of the questions we would have to ask. But if we're convinced that God has called us to do something, do we believe that he has the power to make it happen? Absolutely. But, yeah, yeah. We don't believe he would call us to do an impossible task, do we? That's right, and he hasn't, so. I'm, I'm waiting. a moot subject <laughs> with me. <laughs> I think God changes the parameters for the civilization in hand. We've got all these things in our lifetime now that were unheard of. Mm -hmm. We're not running around with prophets and horse-drawn chariots and stuff like that. We use what we've got to the best advantage, and I think in a lot of ways we are. Now, does that stop us? No. We've got people we live in our streets we can talk to. Mm -hmm. and I think as a church we are starting to realize that probably more than we ever have. 
Do we have any blessings as Seventh-day Adventist Church that we need to be sharing? Yeah. Blessing. Our Sabbath, our knowledge of the Second Coming and all the events of the end of this world's history, our benefits from health reform. I mean, what are we doing about the fact that some of us, all, pretty much all of us here, live in the blue zone, right? Yeah. Are we saying anything about that? Now, obviously there are bad ways to do that and good ways to do that. We don't want to go out and back. Look at me, you know, I'm so good here, you know. But should we be saying something about, hey, you know, there's a reason why people at Loma Linda live longer. Right? Well, it's clear that Jonah's main problem was his own personal reluctance to do what God asked him to do. Are we witnessing to our neighbors, our fellow workers, and our friends as God would have us do? If not, why, what's preventing us? We lost our voices. Well, look at Jonah 4.11. How much, now this is God. I probably should start back with verse 10. The Lord said to him, this plant grew up. Remember the story of the plant that gave him a little bit of shade? This plant grew up in one night and disappeared the next. You didn't do anything for it and you didn't make it grow. Yet you feel sorry for it. How much more then should I have pity on Nineveh, that great city? After all, it has more than 120,000 innocent children in it, as well as many animals. What's God trying to tell him? Get your values sorted out. Mm -hmm. Well, John, he asked a question earlier today, and I'll, I'll ask it again. Was Jonah really the best thing God could find in his day? What is, if so, what does that tell us about the rest? I mean, God didn't have to pick somebody from Israel. He could have some, sent somebody from Judah. Does that mean there was nobody in either Israel or Judah that was any better than Jonah? Yes. I think that Jonah was the best that God could find who would, who would accept the call even even with the force that was provided. You know, Abraham, you know, he accepted the call to some extent. He wasn't perfect. Okay. The Syrian servant, uh, the, the, the Israelite servant of, of Naaman, mm -hmm. she, she wasn't perfect either, but she did a little bit. Mm -hmm. you know, all of these people down through, down through the Bible that, that God talks about, none of them were perfect. Mm -hmm. This is true. And yet, God worked with them. Well, surely none of us have any trouble understanding why Jonah might have been a little reluctant, right? Yeah. What, what excuses do we give for not witnessing in our day? Do we believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a, witness, has a message for the end times? Or we find it much more comfortable just to hide in a nice Adventist ghetto? Well, there's a lot more information. I've mentioned this before, but let me just mention it once again. If you go to www.theox.org, you'll find a lot more information about the book of Jonah, some very interesting historical material and so forth. It is possible that Jonah was reluctant to go to Nineveh not only because he was afraid, but because he felt a cultural and religious superiority and prejudice against them. Now, none of us have any prejudices, right? Well, there's a Christian author by the name of Anne Lamott who put it, you can, be sa you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. <laughs> That's her book, Bird by Bird, New York Anchor Books, 1994, page 22. Are there people in your environment that you cannot reach out to because of feelings of superiority or prejudice? Do you think something like a Jonah story could happen in the 21st century? I think it could. Could God, if one of us, if God found it appropriate, 
Could God, have grabbed one, could God grab one of us today and say, I want you to go to central China? I want you to go to central Russia? I want to go to Iran or whatever? And I want you to preach the gospel for me there. Could God do that? Why doesn't he? We might not have to go that far. That's right. We might just have to go to a local church mm -hmm. or a local city. Mm -hmm. And be rejected. Mm, yeah. One of Jonah's greatest sin was the lack of empathy for the people of Nineveh. He seemed to care more about the plant that had just provided him a little bit of shade than he did about all those people in Nineveh. Are we concerned about the billions of people in our world who have, been not, who have not even heard about Jesus? Would we be willing to do something about them if God called us to do so? Could we at least give more support to those who are out on there on the front lines of mission? And now I read you something very, very sad. If Sabbath school mission offering trends are any indicator, then the grand narrative of global outreach has indeed lost a great deal of its shine for Seventh-day Adventists. In 1932, during the Great Depression, per capita giving to the church's Sabbath school mission offerings was $5.83 per member for that year. That was in the middle of the Depression when $5.83 was a lot of money. More than 80 years later, with wages exponentially higher, the per capita mission giving for Sabbath school mission offerings was actually lower with an average of $4.81 per member in 2010. What has happened? Have we lost our mission? Have we lost our vision? Or are we just becoming more and more like Jonah? Do we want our story to end like Jonah's story? Or do we really believe that God intends for us to go out to repeat verses like Matthew 28, 19 and 20, or Matthew 24, 14, and say, it is my job, God. Call me. Take me where you want me to go and help me to spread the gospel to your children. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this privilege of trying to share the gospel with others. We thank you for the material which has been given us. May we make the most of it as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.